Hey guys, Jim here. Time to do something very special. Uh, kind of a long-awaited deal for me. Uh, it's been quite a while since I've been trying to get my hands on a Bob Terzola knife, and I finally been able to do that. So I've, uh, I'm very fortunate to have been able to add this knife to my collection. And not only that, but to get materials that really speak to me as an individual and, and the, the style of knife that I collect. It's not like you're going to look at any Terzola made available to you and go, oh, no, I'm not going to buy that. I don't like that. But we're all going to have a preference in the materials that we have. And this really, really hits it uh, completely for me. Now, we're going to discuss a little bit about Bob uh, in uh, a little bit. But I want to talk about the knife right from the get-go because I want you to see the beauty of the construction of this knife and the finish work of the materials that are present. First off, we'll start with the bolsters um, on this Eagle Rock. The bolsters are done in zirconium. Now, I'm a zirconium freak. A lot of people know that. But all of the zirconium knives that I own and pretty much every one I think that I've handled has been polished zirconium. So once they've created that oxidized layer, that hard layer, they're polished to a very, very fine grit. What uh, Mr. Terzola has done here on both of the bolsters as well as the backspacer is he has created a matte bead blasted finish. I'm not sure what media he would be using uh, to create this in zirconium, uh, yeah, so please forgive me on that. But what he's done here is he's done two things I've never seen before. There's only a couple real drawbacks or disadvantages to zirconium as far as uh, aesthetics. One, they're fingerprint magnets when it's polished. This obviously is not showing fingerprints. You get a bit of a rainbow hue in various lighting, which a lot of people, including myself, love. But when done in the matte finish, it loses that property. And it maintains a perfect pitch black. I have never seen zirconium that was this black before. And I have to think it's as a result of the process of doing the bead blasting. It looks amazing. <clears throat> As you see on both sides, you have very high grade, no void carbon fiber. And then one of the reasons that I jumped on this uh, was right here. In between the bolsters and the scales, you have inlays of 925 genuine sterling silver. And I think that adds quite a bit of class to an otherwise uh, very pure tactical style folder. Now, for those that don't know who Bob Terzola is, Bob Terzola began making knives in 1980, and then he was basically uh, going into the Knife Makers Guild in 1981, and it was the legendary Bob Loveless that endorsed him to get him into the Knife Makers Guild. So he actually made it in very, very quickly. I know makers that have been making for 20 years um, that are trying to achieve that goal to make it into the Knife Makers Guild. If you don't know what's involved in that, let's just say it's very, very difficult. Uh, you do have to be approved in order to do that. So to, to know that he was able to get in that quickly, you should realize the amount of skill and the quality that he's able to put out. And you'll hear people say quite often that he is the man that wrote the book on the tactical folder. Well, that's actually a very literal statement. Uh, he actually did write the book on the tactical folding knife. As a matter of fact, uh, he created the genre himself and, cre and coined the phrase as well. So what he wanted to do is he wanted to make a, uh, a knife that could be carried discreetly, and used for tactical operations. So he created a model called the ATCF, Advanced Technology Combat Folder. Uh, he did bead blasted titanium bolsters. I believe that had black micarta on there as well for the scales. And that's when he uh, coined that term. And he wrote the book, literally, called The Tactical Folding Knife, that has influenced pretty much every major knife maker that you can think of. Uh, the book is out of print now, as far as I know. The last issue, the last copy I saw sold went for about 500 bucks. I would love to own it myself. I have not had the chance to uh, read through it. I've read excerpts from it, but I've never really actually had a chance to read it cover to cover. So if you're ever, ever able to get the opportunity, sit down, find that book, read it, and understand that this 
this man is where all of that came from. And to own a piece made by him is a major achievement for me. And I, I hope to own several more throughout my lifetime. But they do come with a tremendous amount of expense as well. Now, what you've got here is a blade length that's just a just a touch over four inches, about four and one eighths of an inch in overall length. It's CPM 154. And you're going to notice the finish is gorgeous. And it looks like a nice, rich polish. However, it's not in the traditional sense. He's not sitting there on a buffing wheel to create this finish. I was on the phone last night for a few hours with Elliot Williamson over at Ferrum Forge. And you guys know that he is very much a student of the craft and studies pretty much everything there is about steel, about um, the, the, the whole world of knife making as it is. We were discussing the finishes that he does, and um, I can't say for certain that that process is what's done on this exact blade, but I do believe that it is. What most makers would do on a blade like this is the matte bead blasted finish, and then do a stone wash. Now, that's a two-process way of doing it, and from what I understand, Mr. Tuzola does a third process where then he takes that same blade, he's gone from the bead blasting, he's taken it out of the cabinet, he's put it in the, uh, in the tumbler with uh, you know nice big rocks, takes it out, and then tumbles it in a different media, which as I understand is ceramic rods. And that's what creates this beautiful sheen, this beautiful polish. And when you get in really close, you'll actually still be able to see the stone wash. But you'll notice that it is completely void of grind lines. There are no grind lines whatsoever anywhere on this blade. And the grinds are also what really attracted me to this particular knife. We're used to talking about having the blade flats, primary bevel, and secondary bevel, secondary bevel being your cutting edge. What you've got here, you're looking here for the blade flats. That's not the blade flats. The only blade flat is right here. You have a very prominent top swedge, which creates a wonderful drop down to a very prominent tip. This is actually not your flat. That's your first bevel. So he's beveled that down, and then you have a second bevel here, and then what would really end up being your third bevel is your cutting edge. And that creates what I think is, a, is an incredible amount of drama on a knife that if you're just looking at it sitting on the table, or you're just looking at pictures of it, you might think is a fairly basic knife that maybe would not be very challenging to grind. And then when you take into account all the things that I just told you, you realize that even the most simplistic looks from Mr. Terzola are incredibly complex. To nail that and to get the symmetry, left hand to right hand, on both sides of that blade is magnificent. And it shows you the level of quality that he's able to produce. Now, when we talk about the man that wrote the book, the tactical folding knife, that created the first tactical folder, that coined the term tactical folder with his ATCF, the Advanced Technology Combat Folder. We're talking about somebody that everybody looks up to, that everybody reveres. And it's not just because he's from the old school. You know, there's, there's still a lot of makers that will hold in high regard other knife makers just because they've been in the game for a long time or, you know, because they've seen some shit, they've been here, they've done that, they've paid their dues. You're talking about somebody that has earned the respect by giving back to the industry and by teaching others about what knife making is all about and giving them what is in essence a Bible, a guide, not only how to build a proper tactical folder, but how to run your business how to price your product, how to be fair about it, but how to get what you deserve, how to establish that value, how to maintain your customers by maintaining your own integrity and falling back on the name that you've built for yourself. And I think that's just damn incredible. Let's get back to the knife, though, for a couple of minutes here. The action is 
quite startling. It's not one of those knives that's lightning fast. It's not on bearings or anything like that. I typically don't buy a thumb stud, uh, excuse me, a thumb disc opener because a lot of the makers put the disc in such a weird spot that my thumb may be back here and I can't fully engage it. I can't follow through as I'm opening the blade. Now, with this knife, no problem whatsoever. My thumb is still engaged perfectly, even have a little bit of room left over. It will flick very easily, which is generally how I prefer to open most of my knives. When the knife is open, you look at it and think to yourself, well, it's very straight. It's very blocky. It's not going to be very ergonomic. Well, as a matter of fact, it is. And it's designed that way for multiple handholds. No matter how you feel like holding this knife for whatever cutting task or defensive purpose, this handle is going to adapt to all of that. It's not going to give you certain curves where your fingers are forced into a certain place, which, are, which is totally fine and acceptable in certain knives. But this is a knife that really can be used in a multitude of different holds without having to worry about that. There obviously is some thought to ergonomics and there are some cutaways to allow your hands to drop into place where they need to be. The jimping on the raised thumb ramp is perfect. You'll notice that it will pull the skin away from my thumb, but it's not abrasive. It's not tough. Excuse me, it's not rough. It's not like resting my thumb on a cheese grater. And we've certainly experienced that with certain makers. Everything that's done here is done perfectly. When you feel the overall smoothness of the knife, the integration of the materials, when you make the jump from the carbon fiber to the sterling silver to the zirconium, it is nearly imperceptible. The contouring that's been done on here fits the hand wonderfully. All of the edges are rounded off. There's not a sharp edge on this knife except for right here. And that's all that counts. Everything that your, th your fingers, your thumbs, your hands engage, it's comfortable in every possible way. Silky smooth, nice detent, perfect blade centering, all the things that you would expect in this price level of a knife. Now, I can't say for certain, but I did hear reports back from a few people that saw Mr. Terzola at the uh, most recent show, which was the, uh, the New York show, and they said the least expensive knife on his table, direct price from him, was $2,200. So you got to realize you're going to make a substantial investment. Um, while the Eagle Rock may not be as popular as the ATCF, it is still one of his most popular knives. And you can find them right now on dealers' websites every now and then when you really look, uh, easily $3,500 to $4,000, even without maybe exotic inlays of sterling silver and zirconium and whatnot, you're going to pay a premium. And it's absolutely worth it. The Terzola style was one that took a while, <clears throat> excuse me, took a while to grow on me, only because all of this time chasing grails, chasing high-end knives, it was about maybe crazy designs or, or fancy handles or, or particular fancy grinds that maybe I would pass by one every now and then I go, it's nice, I understand the, the history that's there, but it's not my style yet, it's not my style yet, and I chase something else. And then one day I had the chance to handle one. And I just went, it is a straightforward, simple, and perfectly executed knife for everyday carry. And then you look at the quality of the fit and finish. Absolute perfection everywhere you look. There's nothing that you can pick apart on this knife. Or, from my experience, any of the other ones that I've seen. So that's when I said... One of these days, I'm going to own one. And then I saw the pricing and went, well, I've certainly spent that much on other knives. Why not just do it? And I had the opportunity recently to do it. And it was just perfect. I'm not much of a natural material guy. He does a lot of stuff with mammoth and stag and things like that. That's the type of look that is completely unappealing to me and a lot of people love that and appreciate that and a lot of your most collectible most expensive knives in the world you'll see those materials i'm just not that guy so to come across this 
I love carbon fiber. I'm a freak for zirconium. And having that extra bit of class with the sterling silver inlay, this blade finish, this blade grind, and he does do compound and duplex grinds and whatever else, to have all of this in one package, for me personally, sealed the deal. Now, you may want something that's a bit more exotic. You may want to have superconductor. You may want to have one of his duplex grinds. That's entirely up to you. But to know that you're holding what is really a legendary piece, and it doesn't matter what of his many, many models, it doesn't matter which one you own. When you hold it, you know you're holding a knife made by a legacy maker. You know you're holding a knife that you would much rather consider keeping the rest of your life and passing down to your children than maybe some of the other knives in your collection. And there are going to be a lot of flash in the pan makers. There are a lot of makers that are hot one day and not the next day. They may come and go. They may disappear after hitting a degree of popularity and never come back or pop up again five years later. This is consistent. And I don't want to draw a parallel between uh, Mr. Terzola and Bob Loveless, but just in the fact that when you say Loveless, you know there's a certain degree of quality and there's always going to be a certain degree of collectability, even if the knife isn't a shining example of his work. Because like any other maker, you can have good days and bad days, but you're never going to find a Loveless that goes down in value. And I do believe the same will be said of pretty much any Terzola. Not that I'm buying knives for an investment, not that I'm doing that in order to put my kids through school. I never buy a knife with the intention of what's it going to get me on resale. This is a knife that is in pristine condition as I received it, uh, except for the edge. The edge is a little bit, a little bit dulled out, so I do want to reach out to Mr. Terzola and possibly see if he will put a new edge on it. It could be done by myself or anybody else, but a knife made by someone like this, I'd rather only have his hands on it. But the knife is pristine in every possible way. Well, doesn't matter. This is still going to be a knife that I'm going to carry a lot. And if the need arises to cut shit, I'm going to cut shit. And I get the chance to see how that uh, blade finish holds up. It's one that's excited me to a level that I can't wait to carry it. I can't wait to have it on me all the time. And there's something amazing about owning a knife that makes you feel that good that makes you excited when you open your display case or wherever you keep your knives, your Pelican case or whatnot, and you open it up and go, wow, I, I actually own this. And there's only a few knives in my collection that I feel that way about and have felt that way about consistently throughout the time that I've owned them. Only a handful. And immediately, this has fallen into that category. I know how lucky I am. I know how fortunate I am. And I want to thank my, uh, my good friend Joe for selling this to me and making it available to me and, and honestly, not raping me on it. Uh, he could have easily gotten a disgusting amount of money for this, but uh, he did not. And I feel uh, I was treated very, very fairly. It was still a, a premium chunk of money, not going to lie, but I feel I was treated very, very fairly. To own something that is a piece of knife making history that was touched by the hands of the man that created this subcategory, this genre. You can't help but uh, feel a little bit of pride in having something like this. Just a nice slow look before we exit here. Look at the precision, the fit and finish that's exhibited on every portion of this knife. Even down to the cutaway to give you access to that thumb disc. It's not overly done, it's not overly cut out and dramatic, it's just done right. And there you have it, guys. I'm going to go ahead and end with that. Thank you, as always, for watching. I very much appreciate all the support that you guys have shown me over the past couple of years. And, and hopefully you've had a chance to uh, watch me grow as you've grown as collectors as well and watched as my collection has evolved. And uh, 
and watched your own collections evolve at the same time. And uh, who knows where we're all going to be in a couple of years. Finally got a chance to get it through Zola. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't even know where to go from here. So there you have it, guys. Thank you so much, and I will see you on the next video.